Joan Quinn Profiles. As an editor for Andy Warhol's interview with the Los Angeles Herald Examiner, LA Style, and Detour Magazines, Joan covered the social set, the Hollywood hotshots, the international art scene, the mysteries of food, the excitement of travel, and the fabulous world of fashion. Joan continues to find creative people on the cutting edge who make things happen. Here's Joan Agajanian Quinn. Hi, I'm Joan Quinn, and welcome to the Joan Quinn Profiles. Waiting to be profiled are actor Dermot Crowley and producer Steve Cisneros. Um, and Steve is from the Phantom Projects Theater Group. Actor Dermot Crowley was born and raised in Cork and went to the University College in Cork, Ireland. He acted on major stages in New York, Los Angeles, London, and Dublin. And he's uh, had extensive roles in TV and on um, numerous films and, I don't know, I think funny films like Son of Pink Panther and yes. Octopussy. Yes. Were they funny? Yes. What <laughs> they, they were, yes. But, um, uh, Roberto Benigni played. Um, in, oh, that's uh, funny alone, yeah, isn't yeah. it? He was, he was very funny indeed. Um, that was great fun. We shot that in uh, Nice in the south of France for 10 weeks. What kind yeah. of, you had character roles, obviously. I did indeed. You weren't the handsome man on stage, Sadly were you? Sadly not, no, no. <laughs> No, I played Francois, who was the um, sort of uh, assistant to Herbert Lom, a rather bungling uh, French policeman. And Octopussy, was that a different role uh, from uh, Babel? It, you it, did Babel it, also. Yes. Uh, Octopussy, I played a, a Russian colonel who uh, tries to blow up the train and uh, sets a bomb on it to um, get Roger Moore. And, and in Babel? Didn't succeed. You didn't get him, no. <laughs> But you had a Russian accent? Uh, yes. And yes. how do you get something like that? Because you're from... I, I'm from Ireland originally. I'm Your accent isn't so strong though, is it? Well, I, I've left Ireland quite a long time ago, really. Uh, so it's, it's not a particularly strong Cork accent. Um, but I was born and raised in Cork, and I stayed there until I was in my um, early 20s. So that was, yeah, you got rid of it quickly. Yeah. Do you use a coach, like, to get a Russian accent, or can you do it yourself? Well, well you, you, you can. I mean, on big movies like that, they would have a, a dialogue coach to help you. And the, and the same for Babel? And the same, I mean, Babel we shot... Uh, in uh, Morocco uh, a couple of years ago, and um, I mean that was interesting to work with um, uh, Alejandro Gonzalez in Rija, who's a wonderful director. He's fantastic, yeah, he's isn't he? Fantastic. Yeah. yeah. He's so uh, the thing that surprised me: New York City Center. You sang in the musical Juno. I did. Yes. <laughs> Are you a singer? <laughs> no. <laughs> I'm absolutely hopeless, but uh, I suppose you have to confront your fears in this business. And and uh, and I, well, when they first offered me the role, I, I actually said no. I, I was in London at the time, and I said no, absolutely, I can't sing. And they said no, 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 no. We think you'd be terrific in it. And I said no, you don't really understand. I said I cannot sing, and so I insisted that they audition me. So um, they sent over some music to London and we got a pianist and uh, went into a studio and I recorded um, a couple of the songs. Without the having anyone help you we, we, or anything? Well, the, like the, the pianist was very good and he tutored me a little bit and I recorded and, and uh, we sent off the, uh, the recording to them in New York and to my amazement and surprise they actually came back and said yes we'd still like you to do it so I felt I couldn't back out at that stage so I did it and it was a great experience it's very frightening was that the only one only musical? that's the only one and I've done it and I am <laughs> never ever going to do it ever again never say never <laughs> they're gonna offer you something like Dr. Doolittle oh, and you'll yeah. say yes I'll take it right but I mean it was extraordinary because the, the way they do that at the city center they revive old musicals and you have have 10 days rehearsal and then it's in front of 1800 people with a full orchestra uh, quite phenomenally frightening that's why I thought is this part of his classical training the music uh, part of my classical yes. training no absolutely <laughs> not I mean when I was a small boy in Cork my my mother um, got me piano lessons and had this very fierce teacher called me Connor and I was absolutely hopeless. Miss O'Connor, we always remember those, don't we? I know, I know. 
It, it, it was, uh, it, no, I had absolutely no musical talent whatsoever. And um, fortunately, I managed to find acting somewhere <laughs> along the way. <laughs> How did you find acting? Did you always want to be an actor? I, I did. Uh, I, I, I was, I suppose, relatively precocious. I was an only child and I wasn't very good at sport. In fact, I was hopeless. And I remember, I mean, my earliest memory of it, um, I, I must have been about four and I was chosen to play the part of the third shepherd in oh. a nativity play at school. We always get the Christmas we, play, The don't? Christmas play. <laughs> and I somehow developed measles or mumps or scarlet fever oh in the course of the rehearsals. Oh. And I was replaced as the third shepherd uh, because I missed rehearsals. And I remember my mother taking me to see it when it was finally uh, on at the school and having this visceral oh. rage against this other four-year-old who oh. had taken my part. You really wanted I wanted it. to murder him. <laughs> I wanted to kill him. That's great. And, uh, and I suppose that must be where some, it, it triggered something in my brain that I thought maybe this is for me. That was the turn in your acting. <laughs> it was. That was my big break. That was <laughs> I like that. When, uh, I know you've, you've done so much on stage. Patrick Marber, who's a fantastic writer. He's a you, wonderful you've, writer. You've uh, worked on his a plays at choice. Long Wharf and Manhattan uh, Theatre Club. Yes, yes, I did. And uh, compared to Mart, uh, Martin McDonough, yes. how, are the, how do you say the words? How do you get the cadence between different uh, writers like that? Well, I suppose they are, I mean, both of them are extremely modern writers. Uh, Patrick is quintessentially English sensibility in terms of his intellect and his approach. Um, Martin uh, writes wonderfully well of his Irish hinterland, as it were. Most of his great plays, like The Beauty Queen of Linan and The Lieutenant of Inishmore and indeed The Cripple of Inishman, are all based in, on Galway and, and the surrounding west of Ireland. Where he was brought up. Well, he was actually born in, in, in England oh, but, oh. of Irish parentage, but he spent a lot of his time when he was a child in, in the west of Ireland and goes there frequently. So he knew that area. Inishman is at the Kirk Douglas Theatre right now, and yes, you're acting in it with Dervla Malloy. Malloy, indeed. And a whole cast of people. I, I saw your picture in the LA Times. I was very impressed. <laughs> it talked about your role. You didn't sound like a very good guy. Well, you know, he. I mean, actors should never take moral judgments on their characters. I think he's a terrific guy. <laughs> but he, um, he, he's he's a rather vicious. Uh, walking newspaper really he he brings the news to the islanders the play is all set in 1934 um uh, on a, a remote uh, irish uh, island and we're talking about the cripple, of the, the cripple of inishman the cripple of and uh, my character who's called johnny patty mike is um what a name it's a great name I johnny, mean, a, patty mike. johnny patty mike is this, <laughs> and uh, he uh, he brings all sorts of momentous news like the fact that he's just learned that there's a sheep out in Kerry with no ears on him, for example. And he thinks that this is a great piece of news and uh, he's not concerned with how the sheep can hear. He just wants to bring the news that the sheep doesn't have any ears. But he eventually brings major news and the major news he brings is that there's an American film company uh, oh, uh, right. uh, yes. about to make The Man of Aaron on the main island. And of course, this galvanizes the life of this small community. That's right. I, uh, I, I remember now that the movie company is coming, but he's he's kind of... Mean, he knows his mother is on her last leg and he's like plying her with liquor. Oh, he's trying to kill her with drink. <laughs> yes, right. yes, because he can't stand living with her. <laughs> so he, he does things like, you know, she's, she's ill in bed and, and, uh, and he, he, she asks for a drink and he gives her a bottle of whiskey and says, I want to see half that gone by tea time. <laughs> <You know? laughs> but I know. Uh, he's outrageous, Martin McDonough, but, it, uh, you know, he approaches really basic sort of human emotions like love and life and loss and longing and belonging as a community um, th through the sort of medium of black humor. So he makes you, it's really, I mean, you can't say it's a humor, it's humor, but in a, it is humor if you have the guts to laugh at exactly. something like you just said. Exactly. I mean, it's outrageous. And the wonderful thing about McDonough is that 
audiences laugh despite themselves and part of them are <laughs> thinking, I shouldn't be laughing at this, but it's very, very funny. I know. You know or or um, how could they say that? Oh my gosh, how could they say how that? Could they Did you have to have some special insight into this character? Or have you played him so much you know him? Well, I, I hope I know him now. Uh, I mean, it was a gift of a part. So when you... I mean, I think Martin McDonagh's plays are like pieces of music. They're, they're so carefully annotated. Right, they're and like choreographed. To totally choreographed and uh, incredibly well and cleverly constructed. So that if you obey uh, his, um, his, his notes, as it were, it, it will work for the audience. You will, you will get the laughs and you will get the tears too, hopefully. Well... Um, I love the Kirk Douglas stage. Do oh, you like it? It's wonderful. It's so intimate. It's, I know. I love I mean, it. 300 people, you walk out, it's like being in somebody's living room. I know. It's and you're terrific. sitting really close and you can see everything. And, yeah. and I, I love it a lot. But it, talking about that kind of situation, I met you at the Jack Rutberg Gallery. Yes. And Jack has a gallery on La Brea. Oh. He's had it for 30 years. And it's magnificent. Isn't it beautiful? Oh, it's beautiful. And he also represents an Irish uh, artist. Does Patrick Graham, who's a fantastic Indeed painter. Indeed he does, yes. And that was very intimate. We were sitting on top of you. Yes. Tell us, it was an evening of, uh, give me your hand, an evening of poetry by Paul Durkin. Yes. But it really wasn't that, was it? it, it well, <laughs> it, 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 it wasn't just that. I think uh, Paul Durkin is an incredibly eminent and famous Irish poet, and he has a large body of work, but his... Um, he wrote a collection called Give Me Your Hand, which was a collection of poems based on the paintings in the National Gallery in London. Uh, some very famous paintings like Van Gogh's Cornfield with Cypresses or Reuben, oh. Samson and Delilah. And he wrote a poem to, to each painting. Uh, and a bit like Macdonough, they're extremely off-the-wall, funny, uh, a, a sort of a, a left-of-field approach to a classical painting. Yeah, not what you would expect the painting to say. Absolutely not. And so uh, when I first read it, I was absolutely knocked out by the collection. And I thought, this deserves something more than just uh, me reading it privately. So I contacted my friend Dervla and we eventually got a little evening together where we read the poems oh. and show the paintings. So did you put it together? Yes. As, as much as like picking the paintings and... We, we, well, well I mean, the paintings had been picked by Paul Durkin, yes, but, but we, we picked the poems and the order in which they yes. came, and we also wrote links so that we told people a little bit about the artist and then read the poem. Oh, that was brilliant. But it seems to have worked brilliant. really well. Do you need a, a director or do you direct self-direct? We self-directed that really, although we could do with somebody with an eye possibly coming to have a look and, at it. Well, we were in this intimate situation where we were all on the same level and chairs around you, like a horseshoe uh, gallery. Have, have you done it on stage? We have, yes. We did it on stage in uh, Chicago oh. at the Shakespeare Theatre in Chicago. And uh, we've done it at the Crawford Gallery in Washington. Uh, we've done it at the Century Club in New York. Um, we've done it in London at the Irish it's Club. It's wonderful. It's great. It's, it's wonderful, and it was sponsored. I, I, I know we have to go, but it was sponsored by the U.S. Ireland Alliance. Yes, indeed. Which is fantastic. Trina group of Vargo people. organized that with with Jack Rutberg, and it was um, a fascinating evening. We loved doing it. Yeah, it Thank great. you so much. Yeah, it's my great pleasure. Thank you, yeah. and we'll be right back with artistic director Steve Cisneros. <laughs> I'm here with producing, artistic director, and founder of Phantom Projects, Steve Cisneros, who was born and raised in La Mirada, California. He dropped out of Chapman College uh, to create Phantom Projects. The company has grown over the years to enjoy all this international presence. Uh, but through the years of success, Steve uh, hasn't moved very far from his uh, little beginnings. <laughs> the Phantom Theater Group is back there in a 1,200-seat La Mirada Theater of Performing Arts, and that's their home base. It's our home base. Our, our offices are in La Mirada, the theater's in La Mirada. My parents are in La Mirada, which makes it very convenient for myself. I know you never 
how did you become international when you've been such a homie there? <laughs> <laughs> you know, it's interesting. We, um, in the early days of our company, we started off doing traveling shows that would go into schools. And we would have oh. real teen performers go speak to teen audiences about these important topics. And we started getting calls. Um, the Associated Press did an article about us. And it was picked up across literally the entire world. You mean and when it, you first started? In the first four years of our company, yes. Yeah, it was the first few years. And uh, we, had, we had a camera crew from France fly out to do a story on us, um, from Russia. Uh, and the article was covered literally in every country in the world. It picked up somewhere. Why? Um, the unique aspect of the early years, we had teen performers speaking to teen audiences. We would go into the schools uh. doing anti-drug shows, anti-racism shows. Um, bullying, things like that, and we still do those shows, but our overall core has, has grown over the years. But that was what we did in the early days and why we got so much attention back then. Is that what you had wanted to do? Did you think you were going to do that? Did you think you were going to have a, a troupe, or did you just uh, decide you were going to produce those things? All of the above, yes. <laughs> I, I, <laughs> yes, I mean, theater was something I've been a part of of my life since I was a kid. So I've always wanted to be a part of theater. Oh, you were? Always, In yes. La Mirada? In La Mirada, at the high school. Uh, even I, I produced my first play in the fourth grade. I actually uh, did a, wrote a little play, and the teachers allowed me to have my friends perform it, and we did a school assembly. Were you acting? As a, as a, I, for a few years, I did. For about 9 to 15, I did some theater and, and small film, things like that. But it really was never my main focus. And as I got older, it became producing that I wanted to go into. And you got older out of Chapman College. Right. 17 years old, you start this company, producing it for a big company, uh, performing in a 1,200-seat arena. How, how did you have the courage to do that? You know, the La Mirada Theater has been very good to us and the city of La Mirada in general. Um, we started off rehearsing my parents' garage uh, <laughs> and our driveway. And as the quality of our shows grew, uh, La Mirada Theater saw we had something special because at the time, as most theaters do, they have children's series and they have adult series. But and they have that outreach, and right? It was a lot of time. And back then, not so many did. It was kind of a newer aspect at that point. So we were, we were one of the early groups to say, let's do theater for that in between audience. Yeah. And so we started doing that and they thought we had something good to offer and we've been growing ever since then at that so, point. So in a way you were developing the cultural hor horizon in La Mirada Very and much using so. the big theater. Were you filling it? We were and we still are. Our last show we sold over 6,000 tickets for. Um, and what a, was that? The Giver, which was based on a very popular book. It's a somewhat new book. I didn't read it in school, but anybody who's 18 and under has read this book in school. And we sold so many tickets so quickly to that show. I had teachers calling me from home at night saying, I heard you do The Giver. I want to come see it. So we do fill it up. So it still is a young audience. Well, some still... of our shows are geared toward young audiences. Yes. Our most recent piece, The Bluest Eye over in Santa Monica, is definitely for an adult audience and has been getting those kinds of crowds. So, so The Bluest Eye, tell, tell me, where? It's a Toni Morrison play. It she is. wrote it. That's and correct. where is it going to be? At the Miles Memorial Playhouse in Santa Monica. We run until April 24th. Oh, I see. And why did you go there with it? Because it's a different genre? Or? It's a different genre. We did do it last year at La Mirada for one night only. And it was an amazing show. And the audiences, we filled the theater. Audiences loved it. And the number one comment we got from our audiences was, please do it again. Please bring it to L.A. I want my friends to see it. People need to see it, so we did it for six. We're doing it now for sixteen performances, and response has been fantastic yet again. Well, where did you get your name, Phantom <laughs> Project? <laughs> you know, back to La Mirada again on that one. When I was a, a senior, uh, it, I know it all goes back to La Mirada. It's been a great city for me. Um, when I was a student at La Mirada High School, um, <laughs> I directed a play, and the campus didn't necessarily give me a whole lot of support for that production. I wanted to do things a little differently, so. A security guard and myself would come back on the campus at two in the morning and we would go build all of our props oh. and scenery and it literally became this campus-wide discussion of the phantoms are advertising your show because no one's seeing anyone putting this stuff up because it's happening from 2 a.m. to 5 a.m. when it's all happening so it became the phantoms the phantoms and when I started the company I kind of liked the phantom projects because we wanted to do all kinds of different avenues of entertainment, so it just kind of stuck. The That's Phantom great. Project. You know, there was a street artist called the Phantom. Oh, is that right? Yes, and he would do an <laughs> outline of a person. So I guess he was outlining you. Yeah, maybe perhaps <laughs> foretelling the future. <laughs> How did it grow? How did you, uh, what were you doing at the time to get this company to grow? I think picking the right titles. Uh, as we started to go away from, 
uh, or expand from the teen message-based shows. We started going to uh, books that we all have read, To Kill a Mockingbird, Of Mice and Men, Grapes of Wrath, But aren't classics. those aren't those really tough to produce and Very cast? much so. They are very, yes, very <laughs> much so. And that issue has been there since day one and is to this day. I think every theater company feels that difficulty, if difficulty in recreating uh, a book we all know and love right. so well, and how do you take what we all have in our own minds as a great piece of literature and take that to the stage? So we're very careful in selecting our titles and, and picking the ones that we think, A, will fill seats, there's still that you know financial responsibility we have with the company, but will also be something people are gonna say, oh, I read that book and I love that book, and I would love to see it done on stage. So we're very methodical in our selection process. Do you? Uh do you select the material? I do. I'll I am say. the one that picks our season. Um, I, I read a lot of scripts and go throughout different, uh, always keeping in contact with what scripts are available, what's coming out. Uh, Bluest Eye was something I had my eye on for a few years now, actually. Was it hard to get? Because Tony's a contemporary writer. It was. We didn't get the rights at first. We applied about three or four years ago, and we did not get the rights right away. And we did to keep applying for them. I knew it was something I wanted. did not want to let drop, though. I wanted to keep pursuing that one. And we got the rights to it. I was so very excited. I thought that was a good fit for us. And so, just what we were saying, it's this is out of La Mirada. So, do you use different venues around the city? The Miles Playhouse is our first time being outside oh, of La see, Mirada. It's I our see. first time, and it's the first of many. We hope to do to duplicate our La Mirada seasons. We want to build our shows there, perform at La Mirada, open there because that is our oh, home I base, see. and then take our shows other venues outside of the area. Do you point. have resources from the city, the state, the government? Um, the city provides us with a partnership agreement that gives us a 5,000 square foot warehouse to work out of. We build all of our scenery there, rehearse our shows. Oh, We've got thousands great. of costumes we rent out from that facility. Um, it has become our home hub for everything going on. That's Absolutely. fantastic. And I think in addition to that, you have um, a costume, um, what, uh, part of this company. We do. Oh my goodness. Two years ago, actually less than two years <laughs> How'd ago. You do this? It was unbelievable. Our costumer for the last seven years ran her own costume business out of Irvine, California, and has built this thing into become a massive company. Oh. She retired and decided to donate her entire inventory to us. So we literally have hundreds of thousands of dollars worth of costumes in our warehouse What now. was she doing with them? Did she have Renting them, them out. She would rent them out to schools and theaters across Southern California. So everyone like in, in Orange County area would know? Absolutely. She was always busy. She was always busy. And she just decided, I'm going to retire now. And knowing what we do and having worked with us for so many years, literally handed everything over to us at that point and now we get to reap the benefits of her years of hard work. And what do you, can you rent them out to different places? We do. Places? We've got costumes in Canada right now, we have costumes in New York, New Jersey. You're and kidding! And they're all over the country right now, yes. It's become a very big success to us right now um, and it's helped us grow exponentially at this point. This um company is not a 501c3. We are. Oh, you are? We are a 501c3 nonprofit. So her donation to us was a write-off, but was more than anything just a way to help us do what we do at this point. Yes, but that's why you can get aid, or, or you Absolutely. should be getting aid. Absolutely. <laughs> yeah, we have. We've gotten some great grants over the years from, from state and federal um, to help us update our technologies, get computers, projectors, things like that. Um, we've been very beneficial to uh, reap the rewards of being a nonprofit organization. Do you, do you still go into the schools? We took a couple years off, the economy being what it was. Oh, because it's very difficult. It's very isn't difficult. It? Now, we do still maintain our field trip season. So, at La Mirada, all the shows we do, we bus in thousands of middle school and oh, high school students great. at only $6 a seat, which is pretty much free at this point. Uh, and they bus them in to see our shows, and we have the actors meet them. And It's so great because it's a venue that maybe some kids would never be able to get into. So, I think it's even better than taking it to the schools. It gives them a, a, the idea of going to a theater Absolutely. and the excitement of seeing a stage and lighting. And most of the kids coming in, it is their first time ever being into a live it's theater. so important. It's so important. Absolutely. Um, one of the plays, uh, The Importance of Being Earnest, yes. you have Janet Miller, who's a renowned director. Absolutely. How do you get these people? You know, Janet, has. we've been working with her. She's a resident director of ours. This is her eighth oh, year, is. I think, now working with us. Yes. And she... Uh, every year tackles one or two projects with us, and we love working with her. She's also directing The Bluest Eye for us. 
Um, oh. and, and has just been, just really gets what our company is all about. We work very well with her. Um, and it's, you know, we've got a lot of people who want to work with us, which is so flattering when I think back to where we were 15 years ago to think that people are actually seeking us out to want to work with us. But well, Janet is someone we want that we want to stay with for many years to come. But people call her and want her to come to different parts of the country a too. Absolutely. <laughs> She's in Pittsburgh right now doing a show. Uh, she is always throughout different states, but somehow always make sure she has time on our schedule for us and we, we're very flattered by that. Well, I'm so glad you came and told us about everything. Glad it's to be just here. such a fantastic uh, thing that you've created. Thank you. And never having to take your creative juices outside of La Mirada <laughs> is pretty good too. It's fantastic. I live in Los Angeles, but I go to La Mirada I mean, every week I'm there. It's fantastic. <laughs> Thank you. <laughs> Thank you. And thanks for watching. Keep writing to 777 South Figueroa, 44th floor, Los Angeles 90017 and J-A-Q-U-I-N-N-1 at AOL.com. Bye. <laughs>